I'm leaving tomorrow to go to San Antonio, and uh, you know when you just uh, feel like your world is about to spin out of control? You know, it's funny because when you're leading up to something, like sometimes you gotta leave on, you got to leave town like on a Wednesday or Thursday, and you have so many fucking things to do before that Thursday. Little things like going to the dry cleaner That's or getting I a new pair of sneakers. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to drive to like a mall and park, and it's all these little things. And once it's like once you're on the plane and you put your ass in that seat and you buckle up and you got to turn off your fucking iPhone and all the bullshit, you're like, whew, yeah, no it's doubt. the end of the four days, you know. Yeah. It's been like last week. I had the knee surgery. I know you're looking good, Joey. You know, it's amazing, modern technology. It's like a car now. It's like when I got a car fixed. You know, that's what it felt like. I mean, I walked in to see the sign at 9.30, and at 2 o'clock they were giving me a sandwich, a cup of juice, and my clothes. And they're like, yeah. you're on your way, chubby. You're out of here. And, you know, I came home, and today it was funny because I've been messing around. Like, I, I was trying to work on it before I had the surgery. Uh -huh. And today was my first day of physical therapy. Oh, it was. And it killed me. Like, I don't know what. It was just doing stupid exercises. Like, I had to go home and take a nap. My my afternoon was discombobulated. So it's weird because I thought all this was going to happen. But I had all this stuff clunkled up before the surgery, and I did it. And then. It just died. Like, nothing's going on now. It's just been quiet. So yeah. I understand where you... Well, good. That's good that you can rest during that period and, and all that kind of stuff. What do, you, what do you have shaken? What's going on with you? Nothing, man. I was just... Uh, you know, I got to tell you something. That whole thing, it, it's really weird. Like, when you're young, I always thought I had no fucking empathy when I was young. Like, you have a couple of friends that, that die or whatever when you're young and you, you grieve or whatever. And then as you get older, I think that society starts hitting you in life. And when people pass or something like that, you, you don't really, uh, for for years, I thought I wasn't empathetic. Like, I'm like, somebody died, all right, fuck it. This fucking killed me Saturday. I'm not oh, kidding you. yeah, I know. I'm not I kidding know. you. On I Sunday. I thought about you all day On after Sunday, I, I was walking like in a cloud because whenever somebody dies, yeah, they pass. But I don't think about them. I think about what their family's going through. If you've ever had somebody close to you pass, it's like your world is fucked for a week. Like, everything just fucking stops. You don't know if you're dreaming. You don't know if you... You don't even know if you're living. You, you don't know what this is. You keep trying to open your eyes and going, Lord, please, you know, wake me up so I can know this is a fucking dream. Like, somebody's not dying or somebody didn't die in my family. And just, uh, I, you know, I wasn't tight with Whitney Houston. I don't know nothing. You know what I'm saying? But just a death always kills me. Like, a death like that. And on Grammy Eve and all these people had, you know, their, their nights back. And you know what? She was the best fucking singer that was showing up to that thing. I watched those Grammys yesterday. But that's not the point. The point, it, was just, it just hits home. She's 48. I'm fucking 48. I'm going to be 49 on Sunday. I'm like, well, I make it till 49 now. You, no, know? It's, you well, know, it's fucking crazy. Well, I thought of you just because of your story. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, I mean. Uh, do you want to tell that story real quick to our guest? Or? Yeah. What's happening, man? Hey, hey, give him a shout out. Let, him, let the people know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Because uh, <laughs> well, you were just sitting there like, you know, Christ, when is know, this going to start? I want to jump in as you guys were doing your opening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, a guest should be properly introduced. That's yes, right. that's right. Ladies right. and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to introduce a, a writer, a director. Do you still do comedy at all? I haven't done stand-up in 15 years. Wow. Do wow. you miss it? Uh, portions of it. You know, I, I, I miss the immediacy of being able to go out with an idea that you believe in and see whether or not it works. That's yeah. what I miss. That's always great. That's always the, the great thing is when you have one little gem and one you just can't idea, wait to go out and, and throw it out and yeah, see if it works. I think this is funny. Yeah. Let me go see. And then they do it like twice and they, they don't laugh, but you take it home and you're like, I'm telling you, this motherfucker is funny. funny. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to go to Taco Bell and regroup my shit tonight. <laughs> so, um, but you're a writer, director. I saw, you know, because right before, I've known Ali for, uh, I don't know, 20 years maybe? Long, long time. Long, yeah. long ass time. Long we time. met in Chicago, right? Yes, we did. Yeah. High Regency Improv. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, Catch a Rising Star. Catch a Rising Star. Was it at? Th it was the High Regency in Oak Brook. Yeah, yeah. Illinois. That's right. And, uh, uh, but since I've met you, uh, things have gone gangbusters for you. You uh, were uh, one of the writers on the Chris Rock show on HBO. Yes, I was. Did you win a, an Emmy for that? I did win an Emmy. Congratulations. Okay, I'm trying to be all smooth. How yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, 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 tell us, uh, uh, amongst other things, I know that uh, you were a creator of the Chris Rock show, which uh, was... Uh, uh, well, a, no, it, everybody hates Chris. I'm sorry, uh, everybody <clears throat> yes. hates Chris, but then you were a writer on the Chris Rock show. Yeah, I was a writer on the Chris Rock show, and... Uh, 
uh, right, one of the co-creators of Everybody Hates Chris. <laughs> and also, uh, uh, were you a writer? You were a producer on Pootie Tang. I was one of the producers on Pootie Tang. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, and my name is Ali Leroy. That's right, Thank ladies you and gentlemen. <laughs> Ali Leroy. You, you know, I mean, the segues and the sidebars. You, know, you would have been like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, thank you so much for coming in and thank you. on the podcast today. Hey, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're Felicia. Why would not come here? Uh, Where are you sweet. from originally? I'm a Chicago man. Oh shit! All right, South, the South Side, Side Chicago. There you go. Yeah, buddy. Oh, by Harlem. What's the, what's? The... Uh, no, no, no. See, we're, we're different. That's that's some New York shit there. No, what's yeah. that? I always get confused. Oh, I'm well, there, there's there's a Harlem Road. Harlem Road. But that's that's way west in Chicago. Okay, what's uh, the... the the part of town I lived in was called Inglewood with an E. Out on the front, uh, which is the murder capital of Chicago. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Inglewood was pretty bad. I guess yeah. anywhere that's called Inglewood just is All not, the Inglewoods yeah, are bad. Yeah. Inglewood, New Jersey, Inglewood, California, Inglewood, Chicago. All the Inglewoods are bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, what uh, so I, I always wanted to ask you because there's so many things I don't really and, and uh, realize about you like how did you get into comedy that's my big question like and I know everyone always asks that but uh, uh, you know how did that happen for um, you um all right I, I I liked writers uh, my mother used to uh, she used to watch like the Carol Burnett show when I was a kid. You know, I'd lay on the floor. Sunday variety shows were all big. Then it was Carol Burnett, Sonny and Cher, all that type of stuff. Flip Wilson. Um, so that was really my first exposure uh, to comedy. But when I first uh, took this vested interest in it, I liked writers. So I would read guys in the uh, columnists, syndicated columnists. Uh, it was Mike Royko uh, in Chicago. Uh, another guy named Bob Green wrote kind of humor-based uh-huh. comedy. Uh there was another guy that did like these little skewered perspective things. Well, uh, how old were you when you were doing that? I don't know, 10, 11 years old. Are you serious? Yeah. So those are the guys that 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 I thought <laughs> I thought the written word was funny. Irma Bombeck. You, you Irma <laughs> Bombeck. My mother used to read Irma Bombeck books. And plus she used to get the Reader's Digest. Uh-huh. And in Reader's Digest, they used to have a ton of little humor. They had jokes, humorous stories, right. anecdotal things. You know, so I was big in the written word, and my favorite comic was George Carlin. Wow. George Carlin was all about the words. Yeah. So, you know, all, all the other, you know, it's like all of the kids, they like, you know, they liked Pryor. You know, I certainly loved Bill Cosby, but the guy that spoke to me was Carlin. It's like, I loved what he did with words. Uh-huh. You know, so then by the time I got to high school, uh, I ended up getting pulled into a, um, a comedy group because I had a column in the school newspaper. And I wrote, uh, you know, like humorous columns and shit like that. And then uh, some other guys who were into sketch comedy Uh saw that I was a writer. And so they pulled me into that group. I had never performed before, so that wasn't my thing. Uh, So I got pulled into this group and I started trying to perform. And I got okay with it. Um, You know, as with all groups, a lot of times groups are just hard to sustain. Uh, We made it through high school and maybe a couple of years uh, after. And then, you know, we broke up and, and had all these crazy permutations and all this shit uh, and after that eventually died down it took about eight years uh-huh. for that to you know to finally pan out uh, I went solo and became a stand up let me ask you this when you were a little boy you didn't walk around in Inglewood with a copy of Irma Bombeck in the back pocket because <laughs> you must have got your ass kicked you know what I mean yeah, you know I was always just like a you know I was always like a weird kid but you know uh, you know you got blocks, you know. When you live in a city, you know the the world is broken up into blocks. Na- even neighborhoods are broken up into blocks, you know. So uh, if you don't cross certain streets, you don't have certain problems, you know. So on that little block where I was, you know, my little four block radius, whatever it was, you know, kids knew me they didn't mess with me too much. I was cool. There was a couple of bullies, no major bullshit. But you know, I did all that Irma Bombeck reading in the house. Yeah. But you know, I'm still you know like a little funny, a little quirky. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, I was never like a big sports guy or anything like that. So where was the first time you did stand up on a stage outside of college? Did you do stand up in college, like on little shows that they would? Have I tried. At I tried to do stand up in college once. I did a, a a friend of mine had a frat, and um, and he asked me to come and MC like they had a talent show. Uh-huh. Uh, I was not prepared. I was horrible. Uh, and I was trying to do some bits and they just hated it and I was getting booed off the stage uh, it was the worst shit but I'll, I'll never forget I was mad 
because uh, like my bits weren't working and these guys like booing me and heckling me and this whole thing. So uh, uh, after about introducing three or four acts and it's shit's just going horrible, uh, I come out and I'm like real somber. Like I'm just not even doing jokes anymore. I'm just gonna come out and fucking introduce the act <coughs> and you know and get off the stage. So I come out. You know, I'm not trying to be funny. I said, all right, this next act, boo, you, you ain't funny, you ain't get the hell off stage. So I get real quiet. <laughs> now, I'm going to sidebar for a second and say I'm a huge Andy Kaufman fan. And I love <laughs> the fact that Andy Kaufman blurred that line between comedy and reality. What the hell am I watching? There's two things that, that, that Andy Kaufman did that uh, always stand out to me. One was when he did the Andy Kaufman show on PBS where he introduced uh, uh, Tony uh, uh, Clifton. Tony Clifton, uh -huh. where he introduced Tony Clifton, the puppet. Uh -huh. uh, and he was doing like a talk show and he had like a, a, a nine foot high desk and the guests had a chair on the floor next to the desk. And he interviewed Elaine Boozler, and it was like it was all this crazy shit, right? Uh, that particular show I thought was genius. And the other thing he did, which I thought was amazing, plus he did like he would host SNL and that type of shit. But I remember seeing uh, uh, Kaufman when he took up wrestling, and he went on the David Letterman show uh, with Jerry Lawler, and he was talking shit to Jerry Lawler. And Jerry Lawler smacked the shit out of him, like right there on the stage yeah. on Letterman. And it was like, it was this crazy moment of what the fuck is happening here? And of course, Kaufman never let on. He would never break character. He would never come out of it and go, ah, that was just bullshit and that's a joke. He would let you, he would leave the building letting everybody believe that he was just in a fight with a professional wrestler and he got smacked and he's gonna sue and he's walking off the stage. And to him, that was hilarious. Uh, so to take me back to the stage where I was getting booed off, I'm out there and, um, you know, and like I said, I'm trying to bring up act and these guys are booing me. So just in the middle, I just stop and I go, fuck y'all, man. I just got a phone call out of the back, man. I just found out my sister's in the hospital, man. Fuck this. And I just started walking off the stage and I get about half uh, the way off and I fall down on the floor. A girl screams, ah! <laughs> People, oh, 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 oh. lights go down. <laughs> About six guys run out. They pick me up. They're taking me off the stage. When we get in the wings, I go, All right, let me go, let me go, man, let me go. And they're like, what, what the fuck is going on? I run back out on the stage. They turn the lights out, and I go, Ha! Ah, I got all y'all asses. <laughs> Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. All y'all suckers. I'm done. Wow. <laughs> that was my foray into uh that was, that was like that was my second time doing stand up. Wow. Uh the third time I did stand up, uh, I actually used to perform with a comedy group, uh -huh. Mary Wong. Uh and we we did sketch comedy, it was like three black guys. We took the name, it was like like a rock and roll thing, Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd. You know that thing. So we were Mary Wong, and uh, is that where you met Lance? Yes. Well, I met Lance in high school. And we're talking about Lance Crowther. Lance Crowther. Yeah. Crowther. He's the guy that pulled me into the group because I was oh, writing for the school newspaper, and he was into the whole Monty Python sketch comedy thing. Uh -huh. And he saw that I was a writer, and he's the guy that pulled me into the group. Um. So after college, you know, we were out and we were doing club shows and that sort of thing. And part of our sketch show was that each one of the guys would do maybe like a little five minute set. So if we had a 45 minute set, we do, you know, 30 minutes of sketches and then, you know, we do 10 minutes sketches, then one guy would come out and do five minutes of stand up, whatever. Um, and I, I did that on one show, um, maybe like in Springfield, Illinois or something. And in my little five minute segment, um, I forget what the bits were, uh, but all I remember is that I killed. You know, I seldom say that I killed. And after I did it, I was so afraid to do stand up again because I thought I would never be yeah. that funny anymore. Because you I can't figure it out, right? When and it I did not like do that. stand up again for another 
seven years. Oh, really? I wouldn't do it. What did you do during that seven years? We were doing sketch stuff. Just sketching? We were just doing sketch, but I wouldn't do stand-up anymore. Wow. We, I wouldn't do stand I just couldn't, you know, because I had, I had been nervous, I had been booed off the stage, and I had been hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> These three entirely disparate... You know, so experiences, two out of three is and suck I didn't. I did not times. have. I didn't have control over any of them. Every time I thought I was doing the same thing, and one time it went one way, one time it went drastically another way, the other time it went a drastic third way. I'm like, all right, I, I don't know how this works. <laughs> it's like when you watch one of those superhero movies or something, and the guy's trying to figure out how his powers work. <laughs> you know, he takes off his x-ray glasses and burns a building down. And I right, fuck, I'm not taking them glasses off no more. Not till I figure this shit out. <laughs> so, so during this time that you were doing sketches for seven years, uh, how did you get by? I mean, that's out of college. Like, were you making enough money to get by? Or? A little, you know, I was a, I was a late bloomer. I lived at home for a long time. I lived at home way too long. Oh, you really? know, but it was just me and my mom, and you know, she didn't seem to uh, uh, be too concerned, or at least she didn't tell me. I would find out later that she was concerned, <laughs> but nobody in the family told me <laughs> that she was very worried that I was never going to leave. <laughs> that was a conversation they all had when I was not around <laughs> that I wasn't going to make anything of myself. Uh, but no, nobody. They totally remember the Irma Bombback incident. Yeah. yeah, nobody came and told me. You know, everybody's worried that you uh, are going to be a deadbeat. <laughs> uh, but we started making some money. We started touring colleges and doing that sort of thing. So I started to make a little money and was saving and that sort of At stuff. At what point did you and Lance decide to go off on your own? Um, I and think, Lance, let's just explain to people that don't know who Lance, uh, yeah, Lance Crowther, Crowther is. He was in a, he was also one of the writers for the Chris Rock show, yes, and then producer. he was the star of Pootie Tang, yes, which is Tang. a hilarious movie. Yeah. And uh, so, you guys, how long did it take before you guys split off? Um, <coughs> after I had been doing stand up for a little while, um, you know, Lance, had, I think, had broken off from the group himself, and he had been doing stand up, and. In conversations, we decided that maybe we would try to write together, uh, you know, for TV and and uh, for film. So we decided to become a team. And after that happened, you know, we specced a few things, didn't go anywhere, you know, TV shows, that sort of stuff. Uh, in 1995, I think it was 95, uh, Chris Rock was uh, coming off the heels of doing his uh, Bring the Pain special. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talks began for him to do a uh, series on HBO. Now, we had met Chris, you know, out on the road, you know, in the 80s. So we had known him by that time for, you know, eight or nine years. We weren't close. That's what I was going to ask you. It was no. just like a, a general, like, yeah, I mean, we were we, we, working we, in yeah, the same circles. Yeah, we, and... you know, we, we had been in a lot of the same shows. We'd had a lot of conversations. We were certainly friendly, you know, um, but, you know, we hadn't spent like this whole, you know, great intensive time together. Uh, but, you know, he thought we were funny and, you know, we thought he was funny. And, and when he was getting ready to do his HBO show, he called and was like, I'm getting ready to do this show. And, you know, I want you guys to come out and write, you know, for me. So uh, you at know. that time when you saw Chris Rock, did you ever think uh, this is the guy? Well, you know, he was always uh, he was always funny and. He always had, you know, in a phrase, this this swagger. He always presented himself as being better than he was. <laughs> he caught his his swagger and his confidence. You know, his material eventually caught up to it. Right, right. <laughs> you know, by the time it got to to bring the pain, you know, Chris Rock was actually as funny as he thought he was. <laughs> Prior to that, he he performed like he was the fucking greatest act ever. He had all the attitude, he had all the swagger, and the and the jokes had they they had structure, they had point of view, they didn't always have the biggest laughs, but he was always going for something. You know, he was aiming high pretty early on, and you know he had done uh, he had done uh, I forget what the name of the of the album was he did. Uh, he'd had one album out, which didn't do, you know, make a lot of noise. He'd had Big Ass Jokes, which was another special on uh, HBO. It was a half hour. Um, 
but it was post OJ where bring the pain just all the right shit happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all the right shit happened that needed a guy with that much swagger, that much bravado, that much fearlessness to say the shit that nobody else was saying. Well, that's and what he'd I... been trying it the whole time. He just didn't have shit to talk about. He's fucking 25 years old running around telling people about relationships. Shut the fuck up, you're a kid. You know, what do you know about relationships? Then he got in one. <laughs> so after that happens, that's when it actually becomes something. You know, he actually ended up in a relationship. He was reading newspapers. He was having real experiences in real life. And then you're a real adult and you can comment on them. Right. You know, prior to that, he was a child talking about grown up shit. Then he grew up. Yeah. Well, I say it to people all the time when, when you talk about comedy, like there are so many people that are truly talented, right. that are wonderful at what they do, but, but the right amount of events have to happen around them in order sometimes to push them to that point. Well, you know, when, you're, when you're a comedian, if you're not doing, you know, kind of superficial, goofy shit, I mean, you know, you can get a laugh. <laughs> by doing all kinds of wackiness, you know, if you're a prop comic and all kinds of shit, like, it's not like you can't get a laugh, and it's not that it's not a respectable laugh. But if you're talking about the human condition, you actually have to have experiences because people have to inherently understand that you know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> right. You can't be talking about relationships and you haven't been married. You don't have any kids. All you had was girlfriends. You know, I love Jamie Foxx, but it's pussy, 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 pussy. It's like, uh, okay, so you fuck a lot of girls. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I am a lover of pussy jokes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know, it's really weird because I had been doing comedy in this town since 97 in LA. And I could always get laughs. Right. You know? And, uh, there was a comic that was a uh, uh, 2007 uh, Showtime thing, did a mm. series of these dirty shows. And a friend of mine was on the show, a dear friend of mine. And I was at home and I was watching the episode. You know when you put something on and you're not watching? Right. You're just doing your shit, you're on right. the computer. You... And I l listened to him uh, doing his jokes without watching him. And it dawned on me how bad of a comic I was. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> because that's what I was doing. I had right. finally put it together. And I said to myself, you know what? Everything now that I do, because that's all I was doing on stage was jokes, and we understand right. that. You know, this is a fucking... At 20 years, you're still learning at comedy. Right. At 20 right. years, you're still learning at writing. Right. That's the great thing about this shit. At six years, I'm, I've done it all right. as a fucking right. plumber. <laughs> I've sucked all the shit out of every fucking toilet in Chicago. Right. But at 15, 20 years with comedy, and... and the last two years, I've been talking about all the fucked up shit in my life. Right. You know, you compare it to something that's going on, and you throw what's going on, and, right. and there you fucking have it. I right. mean, you know, uh, the other night I was on stage, and I was thinking about, I was trying to do material. You know, I like to take chances every time I go on stage. Right. I really do. There's no reason to go up there if you're going to take a chance. <laughs> and if you ain't going to talk about that shit that happened in Miramont last week with kids, you know, when I was a kid, you got smacked around by a fucking nun or something. Right. That was bad. That was bad, you know. But to fucking give somebody a cookie with sperm on it, you know, how are you going to recover from that shit yeah. as a kid? That, that's well, you know what got me is that they interviewed some little girl on the news, and she was like, yeah, he gave me a cookie. Like, why did you put her face on the news? Like, she's going to be hounded for the rest of because her life. Because they need viewers. <laughs> I, I want to see the girl that ate the sperm cookie. <laughs> My, Show me a film of that at eleven. That, you know, and, and that's you, what I want to see. And you feel terrible. bad because sometimes is that her? Some, that's the girl. Yeah, wow, sometimes something happens. Cookie. Sometimes something <laughs> happens to take light off something. And in a way, the Whitney Houston thing took light on that because it was like four or five days on KTLA. That LA, <laughs> I'm on there to look at what where not to drive. That's the only reason why I watch KTLA. <laughs> where not to fucking drive? The one ten, the one thirty four, <laughs> and they beat this fucking teacher thing into your head last <laughs> week. Terrible. And you know, you, you sit there, and that's the only way, I, like I was thinking about how can you go into it without being jokey? Yeah. And that's to compare your life as a kid to that and go fuck that, you know. Let you me know. ask you this, Ollie. I'm sorry to skip around. No, so no, much, go ahead, go ahead. We're just let talking. Let me ask you this. What was really the hardest time for you in comedy? Uh, where, where it made you really second guess yourself? It made you really be like, oh, is this really what, did you ever have a time like that? Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, I'll tell you exactly what it was. Um, so I had been in this group, Mary Wong, <clears throat> in, in the early 80s, 
and you know we gone through this thing you have a comedy group you know people have personal shit to trying to work out you have interpersonal relationships that go you know left and right so uh you know at a point in time i was out of the group then i was in the group and then another guy was out of the group then all of us were in the group it was five of us then it was four of us it was three versions of three of us (laughs) it was three versions of two of us Right. You know, and at some point we had done some things. We had been on some of the uh, the New York shows, like uh, when USA. Remember, they said uh, comedy cuts or whatever in the, in the early eighties. Uh, it was on the USA Network. It used to be. Uh, it used to be on Friday nights. It was a show called Night Flight. Uh, Night Flight. From nine o'clock to six in the morning, whatever, something like and, that. And throughout the we night, they put on those things. We had yeah. done uh, 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 Bill Boggs comedy tonight. You know, we'd done some of that sort of <coughs> thing, right? So, you know, we, we'd had a little experience. We'd gotten out to New York. We'd been on TV a couple of times. It was kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, you go through all these different weird little breakups. And, and so it was me and this other guy. And um, we were in Chicago, and we were doing a show out in the south suburbs. And it was like a little one-nighter on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, you know, there was 10 people in the bar and it's the sort of shit where you know there's a TV playing there's a pool table there's some music fucking going and then at 9.30 they shut all that down and go "All right, you guys y'all ready to see a little comedy tonight and it's uh, you can hear the fucking clap echoing off the wall because it's just that one guy talking and I sat down I was like okay you know I've traveled around you know we've done some opening gigs Uh, my group we opened for Whitney Houston at the oh, Park wow. West in Chicago when she was on tour with her first album. Oh, you know, wow. shit like that. You're like, you've done some cool things that impress you when you're 20-something years old. You feel good about where your career is going. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's six years later and seven years later, I'm in this little, you know, fucking hole-in-the-wall bar on some 142nd Street off of Halstead in Riverdale, you know, and it's Tuesday night fucking comedy night and the shit is sad and we're supposed to go up there and do, uh, you know, 45 minutes for nine people <laughs> for $125. Yeah. And I turned to the guy and I went, man, I, you know, we'll finish out the rest of the shows we have booked and then I'm done. Because I, 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 you know, it's like I've done too much good shit and I feel like I'm, I've done too much good shit. I'm too young. I'm funny. Why the fuck am I here? This How did I end up in this bullshit fucking hole in the wall Tuesday night nine people motherfucking club? Fuck this. I don't know what I'm going to do. I ain't doing this. Mm-hmm. So that's what I told him. I said, I'm going to figure out the rest of the shows we have to do. And then I'm the fuck out of here. I did not work at all for six or seven months I literally I almost stayed in the house the whole time and you're living in Chicago at the living time. in Chicago I so almost, you just stayed in the house I was fucking depressed it, you know I'd spent six seven years trying to figure out what to do and I ended up in a fucking hole in the wall and I couldn't figure it out and how then, old were you at this point 26 27 oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Tim Tim Miller was his name he called me up one day and told me that he had booked a string of one-nighters through one of these, you know, these fucking local booker guys. You know, they have a string of clubs through, you know, some region. He told uh-huh. me that he was going out middling in some clubs. <laughs> and that was just a foot in my ass. It was like, okay, wait a minute. I did all the booking. I did all of this. You know, I did all this shit. And he used to just kind of lay around in the room and sip coffee and get on my nerves. And it's like, you're working and I'm not? That's one of those fucking shocker things yeah. where you go, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was the responsible one. You're working and I'm not? I so, right, fuck this. I got to go work now. So then I just, I booked a bunch of, you know, I called up some guys that knew me. I booked a bunch of fucking one-nighters of all up in North Dakota and all that weird shit. Uh, who are those guys that were up in Minneapolis? Uh, uh, I don't know. I, it's not like- Sobel, but it's Tom and... Uh, Oh, uh, I don't remember. I have the, the worst memory. Did you ever work at the Grand in Grand Forks with that place? At, yeah, at the yeah. Cowboy Boots. Yes, exactly. Yeah, These are Chris, the guys. They, yeah, they booked that. Yeah. This was their run. 
uh, 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 Grand Forks, uh, Fargo, Moorhead, mm -hmm. you know, all, yeah. all of that shit, St. Cloud, oh, all up yeah. in there, you know. That's always pleasant to play in yeah, February. Right, right, right. <laughs> fucking black guy at fucking Fargo, Moorhead doing comedy anyway. Uh, <laughs> but this, these are the places that I went to because I like, if that fucking guy's working, then I got to be working. Right. And that got my confidence going again. And, and because of that, you know, it was just like that was the juice I needed to kind of get back out on the road and go be something. Uh, and it was just that simple. I came to a point. I didn't know how I ended up there. And then a guy who I compared myself to, who was a friend of mine, but who I just didn't feel was as responsible as I had been about this business was working and I wasn't. It's almost like fucking going. So let me get this straight. Whitney Houston's dead and Bobby Brown is alive. Right, right. <laughs> how the fuck did that happen <laughs> you know how the fuck did that happen yeah well yeah i'll tell you how it happened because i'm you know i don't know where bobby is in his world right now but bobby didn't have and you know i'm speculating but uh bobby brown did not have a veneer of innocence people never wanted to believe that bobby brown was a fucking nice guy so he didn't have anything to live up to or anything to hide in regards to him being fucked up, drug addled, irresponsible or whatever else it was. <laughs> Whitney Houston did. So when Whitney went on Oprah saying, you know, uh, Bobby is responsible for doing this to me, <clears throat> Bobby did this and Bobby did that. I don't know what happened, but I do know that she was not taking responsibility for her own actions. She wasn't saying, I was with Bobby when I got high, but he didn't take a needle and stick it in my arm. He didn't take a joint and shove it in my mouth. He didn't take cocaine and push it up my nose. You know, for my own reasons of being fucked up, I decided to do the shit with him. He may have been my gateway, but there are other things I could have done. She was getting high way before Bobby. But I'm just, you know, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know. All I know is that she got on TV and let Bobby Bound be responsible for what she was doing. And now she's dead and he's alive. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah. So she went on Oprah and said that Bobby was her. Yeah, it's a, Bobby did it. Uh, yeah, it's Bobby's fault. It ain't fucking Bobby's fault. Yeah, you know we knew Bobby was fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> we had no idea you were fucked up. And 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 Bobby, you know, even even in coming back, I just saw Bobby in in uh, in New Orleans. He was with New Edition. They was doing my prerogative and all oh, the you hits. Saw him yeah, yeah, he, he was did. singing everything, singing, oh, really? dancing. It was great. You know, his voice wasn't fucked up. You know, I was me and Chris uh, on the, on Chris's show when Bobby went to jail. We went down to Florida to get him out of jail. Oh, you did? Yes. When Bobby Brown got out of jail, uh, <laughs> we we had free Bobby Brown, and we went to Florida. And it was the fucking midnight, and 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 uh, and the, the limo pulled up, and Whitney was in the car. We had five hundred people that we had gotten on the radio station to come down did and go free all Bobby this? Brown. This is on Yes, this is all yeah. filmed. Oh, really? Free Bobby Brown, free Bobby Brown. And Bobby Brown came walking out of that jail at 12.01. And he just came. He had the little bag in his hand with his <laughs> belongings and shit. And they got him all the way down to the edge of the gate. And then Whitney got out of the car and she came. They gave him a hug. And we got a quick little interview. So for me, it was an odd, you know, it's just yeah. an odd kind of thing, you know. Um, did, did you ever at any point <clears throat> in your career, because you wrote for others, uh, and yourself as uh, for yourself as well, but did you ever feel bad about writing jokes about people like celebrities? No. Did you ever have an instance where you felt bad ever? No, because uh, I, I I have a simple mantra. If you to me, if you follow this, it's it's always fair. You make fun of what people do, not who they are. You know, so. Uh, I'm not going to make fun of you because you're fat. But if you do some mean shit to somebody, if you're fucking Rush Limbaugh, then, I, then, then that kind of becomes fodder because part of what you do as a person is cast judgment on others. Mm -hmm. So you've put yourself in a position where you open yourself up by virtue of what you do. If you're just standing there and you're a fat guy, I can't pick on that because what has that got to do with anything? You know, so it, it becomes you have to do something. You know, if 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 Halle Berry, you know, runs into somebody with a car and then races away from the scene. Now I get to make fun of the fact that you did that because that's what you did. Right. You know, it's got nothing to do with you being a star or anything else. We may be able to tie those things to it. But the fact of the matter is you did something fucked up and now I get to make fun of you. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
Did you ever write something? Because um, I'm so curious about the writing thing. Like, did you ever write something that you were like, fuck, I can't believe that came out of my head? Uh, I, I think I've probably written so many things like that and that none of them stand out. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, when, when, when you're a comic and you get into a certain space and you start to have certain ideas, like I say, just, you know, that's just, if, if you're a comic and you're not crossing some sort of line you know that's comics live in impropriety they they if they're not doing what's not supposed to be done i mean our skill is that we're able to take it in and and demonstrate or or, or show the humor in shit that's inappropriate you know if comedy is bad things happening to other people <laughs> you know our skill is being able to present it in such a way that you're able to get the laugh but yeah that's where all the shit is rooted so you know it's like well how extreme is it Fuck, I don't know you know <laughs> you know I was watching uh, Cat Williams mm -hmm. I was watching the one special and uh, you break it down and it was th the first one where he talks about Michael Jackson right, right. And, you know damn Whitney was smoking her kneecaps off and no way and all that shit and right there when he's doing that Michael Jackson bit you could see his transformation that was it. He was he was going against the fucking grain. Right. And he was telling you something that you fucking knew. Right. You know this. I ain't telling you nothing different. <laughs> you could sit there, ooh me and I'm me, motherfucker. But you know I'm right. And it was so weird to see. It's so weird to see the growth right. of a comic or a human being when you're right. That's what we do. We're the fucking voice of society right. in so many different ways. It's just to catch it. And you know what, man? You got to break a fucking egg to make an omelet. Right. And that's just the way it is sometimes, you know? And I think the same thing. I go out there gunning too sometimes, but you're not gunning to fuck with somebody. Right. You're gunning to fuck like, what the fuck are you thinking? It's like, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the conservative right, the Christian right there, they're against gay sex. It's like, the weirdest fucking sexual shit I've ever seen in my life has been done by straight people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, so, you know, fucking an ass, that's that's pretty rudimentary. You know, what's with all this shoving fists in people's pussies and putting my foot in your ass? <laughs> what the fuck is that? They, and they filmed it. It's like, you know, that's a man and women doing crazy <laughs> shit. You know, damn, so really? You have to put clothes pins on your nipples and a latex mask uh. over your face? And then you beat the fucking girl with a whip and you slap it in the head with your dick and that's sex. It's like really I'll take fucking an ass over that. That's simple, you know. It's like really and you guys are against these guys? What the fuck is this gay sex, straight sex? It's all just crazy at a certain well, point. I say if someone wants to get fucked in the ass, they need a ribbon. You know, not <laughs> you get first place. They need a fucking license. That's what they need. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean of the things yes. that you do that you need to be you need certification for. Yeah. That's like that should be one of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like I could never understand the whole gays in the military. Like if you're gonna put a dick in your ass, you got some balls. <laughs> put you on the front line, motherfucker, because you can take some shit, you know? Anyway, sorry to go out like that. Uh, you know, uh, as uh, you were coming over today, I was Googling you. I mean, because uh, I was like, I got to ask very intelligent questions. No, you don't. And, uh, <laughs> and I won't. <laughs> but uh, I didn't realize, uh, which I read today, that you also wrote for Bernie Mac. I had no idea. Oh, man. Uh, me and Bernie, wow. Now, you and Bernie went back to Chicago. Oh, yeah. I've, okay. I've known. What's the name of the street? Harlem? <laughs> Harlem uh, is, a, is a street in Chicago, okay. but Bernie was another Southside guy. Right, I know the Southside. Who's the chick? Uh, who's that? that? Puts the wig on? Laura Hayes. No, the other ones. That one that was on Tonight Show, she's real funny. Robin? What's the last name? Robin uh, Robin Montague? No, that's nah, not. There's a sister from Chicago that's very political that had the dancers that spun around on his dick. She's from the south side of Chicago. And I did a gig with her, and she was telling me all this Chicago heel about her. And who's my other idol? Sweet Dick Willie. You know, I mean, these are my fucking idols. First time I seen Do the Right Thing, and the guy's name was Sweet Dick Willie. Right, Robin Harris. I almost fucking died. I mean, that, that's, I was going to change my name from Joey Diaz to Sweet Dick Joey. What? How fucking great of a fucking name is that? And when I moved here, he was at the L.A. Act Theater, and I went to see him one night. Not even to perform, just to watch him. Right. And I cried. I couldn't even. Then when I found out he died, like I was fucking heartbroken. I didn't even know the man. Yeah. I mean, uh, Rob, Robin Harris's death actually, in a great way, cleared the way for Bernie Mac. 
Oh, really? Well, because because Bernie and Robin had uh, they had a lot in common in the sense that they were they had a, a, a strong culturally sort of southern sensibility. It's not that they were raised in the South, uh -huh. but there's this strain of attitude that comes from the South, but it's kind of you know it's kind of brewed in the city. And and Robin Harris had that, and Bernie Mac had that, and you can't fucking have two of those guys. So uh, you know, uh, Robin died in a show in Chicago at the Chicago Theater, uh, not Chicago Theater, the Regal Theater, on the South Side, and and it you know things dissipated a little bit, and that really did clear the way for Bernie. And I had known Bernie since you know like '79, something like that. And I saw him just kind of work his way up through the club circuit. And, you know, he was real kind of a throwback act. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Bernie didn't have any problems with doing a fantastic joke book joke in his act because his shit was about the performance. If he could perform the joke and get the laugh, then that's what counted. He certainly wrote his own material. And I, I eventually did write a ton of stuff for him. I, I toured with Bernie for, you know, four years on the road. We were doing theaters and to you know mainstream audiences he was virtually unknown uh it's funny i was cleaning out um uh, some stuff in my office a couple of weeks ago and i found a book of material that i wrote for bernie mac and when i say a book i mean it's probably it's got to be 200 pages of material that i would write for him you know uh every week just over the course of about four four years wow. something like that just pages and pages and pages of stuff he's just like you know, um, I mean, he was like a brother to me. You know, uh, he was a genuinely good guy. What's your favorite Bernie <clears throat> Mac memory, if you mind my asking? If you don't mind my asking. <laughs> well, it's uh, <laughs> it was a practical joke I played on him. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to share it? <clears throat> um, we had flown into, I think we had flown into Kansas City to do a show. And, uh, you know, typically when we got off the plane, uh, you know, there'd be some a limo or some kind of car waiting for us, and um, and uh, our road manager, uh, this guy Chuck Gano, would see to it that the bags got collected and got mm -hmm. put in the car and the whole thing. And we usually just go and get in the car and wait. So <clears throat> uh, we get off the plane. Chuck's going to handle the baggage. Bernie goes and gets in the car, uh, and he kind of rolls the window up halfway, and uh, and instead of getting in the car. You know, nobody knows me. I walk up to the car and start kind of peeking in it, going, oh, yo, yo, is that Bernie Mac in there? Is that Bernie Mac? Yo, what's up, Bernie Mac? What's happening, man? Oh, you, ain't, you can't come out? You can't come out the ride and give somebody an autograph, man? He rolls the window up. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Security comes <laughs> and asks me to step away from the car. And I lean into it. You're like, oh, all right. So that's how it is. Bernie Mac got to call the police on somebody. He's the Mac man, but he can't get, he can't write nobody a damn autograph. Fuck you, man. Fuck you, then. Go ahead, roll your damn. Way. I'm walking away. I'm walking away. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> so I literally do move away, and then Chuck comes out with the bags, and then it's like security people watching me get in the same car they were walking me away from. <laughs> but we get in the car, and I go, I'm gonna get you back, man. I'm gonna get you back. So hours later, inside the hotel, uh, we would always get like our suits pressed and stuff before uh -huh. we went on stage. So uh, they deliver Bernie's suit to my room. Uh, so uh, I call him. I go, yeah, man, they brought me a suit. He's like, okay, well, I'm about to hop in the shower, so just bring it down. I'll leave the door unlocked. So I go down to his room. I drop the suit off. Bernie's in the shower. So I take all of the furniture that's in his suite. It's a sofa. It's a dining room table. There are chairs, lamps, shit. I literally put them in a pile and stack them up to the ceiling. <laughs> and leave his suit hanging on the door i leave hour later i'm down in the lobby bernie comes storming out of the elevator beeline towards uh towards the front desk i'm listening to him he did some ruckus and he's like somebody broke into my room took all my stuff <laughs> stacked it up on thing i don't know what the hell y'all got going on here in terms of security but y'all gonna have to figure this shit out because somebody was in my room <laughs> that is so funny i i wait he comes back up, hey man, what happened? Man, Ali, I don't know what's going on in here, man. These people are out to get me, man. Somebody came in my room, stacked all my stuff. We can't stay here tonight, man. We got to get out of here. I don't say anything for another two hours. <laughs> and finally, I tell him, yeah, man, you know, that guy says it. Yeah, that was me. He's like, you motherfucker. <laughs>
<laughs> you, I'm gonna get you back. Hey, fuck, you gonna get me back? You already got me. You almost got me arrested outside the fucking limo. How you gonna get me back? I, I got you back. <laughs> I loved him, man. He was a great guy. Was it hard to? Did you have a period where you jumped between writing uh, with Bernie Mac and Chris Rock, where you were jumping back and forth? Was it? There was a short period of time in early '96 when I was in New York writing for the Chris Rock show, and I was still going out on weekends on the road with Bernie. I was married, uh, living in New York. My wife and child were living in Chicago. So I, was, I wasn't I was home five days a week writing in the studio with Chris and on the weekends out with Bernie. And after four months of that in April, March, April of 1996, that's when I decided I can't do stand up anymore. I'm gonna commit to writing. And that's uh, the last show I did uh, stand up was in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh huh. Uh, opening for Bernie. Um, yeah. That was Do you miss time it? I did it? Like I said, I, I miss being able to go out and step in front of a crowd with an idea that I think is funny and see if there's something to it and get that immediate response and not have to fucking cast it and run it by some executives and pull out the fucking cameras and build a set and do all of that shit. Just walk up, say it, and see if it's funny and know and feel that that confidence and that feedback because as a comic, that immediacy, you know, you learn how to do the other thing, you know, and you learn how to be patient and wait for it, but just the immediate gratification of going out, being funny, and knowing that you got it, that's what I, that I do miss that part about it. And now for a word from our sponsors. Go to tastedvisionart.com. Go visit Derek and the boys. They got some great stuff on there. I just ordered a poster myself of the B-52s again from a different thing. So go on there. Check out tastedvisionart.com and tell them we sent you. Also, MZ Auto Body in Silver Lake. They fixed my car for the second time and did a good fucking job. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to start doing commercials for people, Joey. Somebody hit my wife for the second time on the 101. If you get your car hit on the 101, take it to MZ Silver Lake <laughs> Auto Body. Them motherfuckers don't fuck around. They even fixed the shit from all your previous fucking things. And there's no deductible. Tell them Uncle Joey sent you. That's how I roll. You know why there's no deductible? Because they're fucking foreigners. That's why. Because they're Armenians or Russians and they know how to fucking work the system. You understand me? You don't have to go down there with Prudential or fucking Geico and have the chick from whatever. No! They hook you up. My wife got hit and she goes, I got the car right here. I'm on the 101. What do you want to do? He goes, bring it down. It's for you, Mrs. Diaz. No deductible. I That's like how we were Armenians or Russians. That's right, dog. <laughs> it's the same, they, it's the same. And they send you a fucking calendar over the holidays. When was the last time you got a calendar from anybody in this miserable fucking town? You don't. So far at this point of what you've written, uh, what is the thing you're the most proud of? Like that, that you want your kids when they're grown adults to be like, my fucking dad did that. I mean, you know, it's, it's got to be everybody hates Chris, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, Chris and I came up with that together. You know, uh, here's the funny thing about that show. When we originally conceived it, the kid was not supposed to be Chris. We were thinking that it would be just some little black kid growing up in Brooklyn, like in the 90s. You know, because even at that point, it was, you know, it was 2004 or something mm -hmm. when we originally went out and pitched the show. So we thought, you know, that's 14, 15 years ago. That's long enough. You know, it's like a period piece, but not not anachronistic. You know, it's not so far back that it feels like it's just some kind of crazy nostalgia. Uh, but, you know, Chris is really sharp about certain shit. And one of these things was we, you know, we had a kid and we had a family and he was supposed to do the voice, you know, like uh, like the Wonder Years thing. Uh huh. And one day we're sitting in my office and he goes, you know, if we want to get this on TV, I should probably be the kid. And that was it. Yeah. We made him the kid. <laughs> and, you know, um, in, you know in, in writing that show, um, <clears throat> you know, there's just a, a, a lot of the... Where Chris was absolutely, you know, the, the pure voice behind it, the anecdotal material behind you know, how the family, you know, functioned and who the family members were. And then, of course, you know, he had his voiceover, which is spot on and always funny. You know, where I kind of fit in was 
like this weird kind of left of field humor in terms of the way that it was shot and some of the you know odder little story points. It was it was just like uh, I liked the fact that that we had a great counterbalance. We filled a different space. I tended to think more story driven, more cinematic, and and the the humor that I liked was real kind of bizarre, like left field stuff. Uh-huh. You know, weird shit that was in the dialogue and nice little textures. And Chris's shit was just always like really straight on. You know. Um, and when people initially saw it, they liked it, but the networks didn't uh, really support it. Uh, we didn't get a lot of promotion or anything like that. And then when it finally came on in syndication, uh, I just started to hear it from, you know, all kinds of people. Oh my God, I love that show. I love that show. You know, it just it, it captured a period. You know, I liked that it was about somebody that I had a relationship with. You know, um, I, I liked what we created you know what I mean I just I just really enjoyed it for that you know um, and it's just one of those things that I think it'll you know, I think it'll be around for a while and even and even the fact that it was a it was it was uh, you know making it as a period piece so even when we made it it was like it was already old uh-huh. so it already kind of felt like a warm blanket so you know it always feels like that it wasn't like it was something contemporary and then you saw it 10 years later and it felt old uh-huh. when you create something that you know is already in the past it's it kind of has legs it's comfortable you know you don't hold it to the standards of you know what was funny in 2012 you know it's like ah this shit was in you know 2000 oh okay well then it's already old so right. when you see it later than that it's it's already where it's it always was gonna be it was always in the yeah. past yeah you know, there was no point that it was in the present then you look at it and go Oh, that was funny in 2012, but now I see where it kind of... No, that's always going to be funny. Yeah. Everything on that show. So, I mean, yeah, that show was just really special in that regard. And I and I actually love uh, Head of State that uh, Chris and I did together. Yeah. Uh, because if you, if you watch the film Head of State now with Barack Obama in office, the shit's hilarious. Oh, re- yeah. That's a good thing. We should try to watch that. Well, because, we, you know, we wrote it before a black man was nominated yeah. to be president. We wrote it before any of that happened. And uh, the funny thing about the head of state was, you know, um, when you would hear black comics talk about black president, they would always generally talk about what they would do if they were in office. You know, black president's gonna have this type of plane. The black president's gonna have this type of wife. The black president's gonna conduct these types of meetings, wage this type of war. And he and I looked at it from the uh, perspective of how the fuck does he get an office? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so we approached it from the campaign, yeah. And 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 what that thing was about. So it it owes a great debt to like Putney Swope, <laughs> you know, in terms of 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 how we came at it and the candidate. Uh-huh. You know, when you watch Robert Redford and the candidate, that whole shit is about a guy who doesn't expect to win, then he wins, then what? So the end of the movie is I won and then we're done. Right. <laughs> Who cares what the actual presidency is like? How the fuck does he get in office? So when you look at head of state and look at the campaign and the sort of shit that's said, we are very prescient in the way that we approach that material. Yeah, that shit's really fucking smart. I would rarely say that, but if you look at it now, it's like, damn, these motherfuckers were spot on five years before it happened. <laughs> Um, is it because you've collaborated with so many people? Is it easier or harder to write for just yourself or to do something just for yourself? Do you feel is it easier for you to work with someone or or do you get a little paralyzed when you have to write for yourself? No, because the thing about it is is that if uh, you know it's like being a songwriter. You know, if 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 I can write a, a catchy tune, you know, if I give it to Prince. He's going to perform it one way. You know, if I give it to Justin Bieber, he's going to perform it another way. You know, if I do it myself, it's performed a third way. So, you know, that's where the interpretation of the artist comes in, you know. Um, and it's it's no different in comedy. I mean, a lot of the subject matter is the same, you know. So, you know, I can give Chris Rock a, a bit about arguing with his wife. And I can give Bernie Mac the same bit about arguing with his wife, but because they have different types of wives and they've had different types of arguments, the core joke might remain the same, but you know, how they perform it, how they bring it to life is going to be different. You know, 
Chris might get into the minutia of the conversation and she said this and I said that and when she says this thing what she really means is that and Bernie Mac is going to get into the personality of the situation he's going to get into the attitude that she has when she says it the type of look that she has on her face the types of pauses she takes in the conversation what he's afraid is going to happen if he says the wrong thing you know so you know and, and, and for myself I might just be into the structure of why the argument happened in the first place and what I was thinking when she thought X and what I believe she's going to do. So you can take that same bit, analyze it from three different points of views and come up with three different routines, but it's all the same fucking joke. So n not at all. I just write what I think is funny. And if it's in the landscape of, of what that guy talks about, you know, Chris does relationship material. He has a relationship bit. So does Bernie, but Bernie's a storyteller. You know, <laughs> I'm an analyst, you know, Chris mm -hmm. is a social critic. <laughs> so we come at it from three different perspectives. So, I mean, fuck, it's easy to write a bit and hand it off to this guy and it becomes a whole different thing. You know, he's going to infuse it with some Bernie Mac. Chris is going to infuse it with Chris Rock, you know. Wow. Did they ever get to a point where uh, ha did you write stuff for Chris and then he says no and you give it to Bernie Mac? Or no, were they no, ever no. like, what's up? You give him more than me or anything like that? No, no, no. Like because, uh, well, the... I wrote straight stand up for Bernie and 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 Bernie really drew from me in that regard. I mean, he certainly came up with tons of his own material, but I wrote a lot of stuff for Bernie. Uh, Chris, on the other hand, when it comes to his stand up, that is his voice. Chris is 99 and 44, 100 percent pure when it comes to stand up. He might come to some guys that he thinks are funny and get some taglines or maybe a joke, you know something like that but but the bulk of it is Chris but when it comes to visual stuff you know that's when Chris and I became real collaborators mm -hmm. because I just thought that uh, in terms of dialogue in terms of, of creating scenarios and storytelling you know I was just more much more grounded in, in that field and, and a, a stronger writer in that capacity than Chris was so when we start getting the stories and script and you know sketches and that sort of thing then then it became more about the sort of material I was giving him and letting him infuse his sensibility as opposed to his stand-up which is he's got this really pure thing that's happening and then he comes to you for just a little dab of icing on his cake do you ever get afraid that you're gonna run out of ideas no uh, Franklin Ajay uh, once said it might be in his book he's got a book about stand-up comedy that's really smart um, but Franklin said, you know, at a certain point in your in your career as a stand up, you start off talking about the things that uh, come from your life. You know, the, the people that you grew up with, your relationship with your mom and your dad or whatever else it is. And his thing is eventually you run out of that stuff. You know, your um, the amount of time that you spent on stage has has uh, uh, caught up with the amount of experiences <laughs> you know that you've had in your life you've run through all of that shit and now you have to talk about something else and then you got to come outside of yourself and and functionally you kind of become a social critic at some point mm -hmm. you start drawing from the outside world for inspiration so you know and 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 comedy doesn't have shelf life generally speaking you know certainly not for a stand up you know, fuck, when you're, you know, uh, I don't know, you're Usher, you can sing the same fucking 10 yeah, songs shit. for the next 20 years. You know, fucking saw the Beach Boys last night on the Grammys, they're singing the same shit. They don't need a new song. No, but if you're a comic and you You sing, gotta fucking you're keep fucked. coming Everyone, up with new yeah, shit. Yeah, I know, everyone's on ya, you know. <laughs> when you're a comedian, you have to keep coming up with new shit. You don't have the luxury of running out of ideas. But what you can do is apply your point of view to the current shit that's happening. So, you know, hey, last week we didn't have sperm cookies. This week we got them. <laughs> Why do you need to ruin a good cookie with sperm? Why? Sperm is good enough. You know, like, whoa, what the... F <laughs> like, I, I, like I, I, don't even, I don't even understand the, the, the form of sickness where a guy's going, all right, I want to do something crappy to kids. Let's see what's been done. All right, uh, they've had them in basements. Uh, let's see. Uh, we didn't feed them. Let's see. They handcuffed one to a radiator. What else have they done? Done some fucked up shits to kids. Uh, let's see. All right, well, they, uh, they, just, they drowned some in a car. Let's see. What else have they done? Ah, I got it. <laughs> I'm going to put my on sperm cookie. on a cookie and feed it. <laughs> they have it like, you know, the level of invention that mm. goes like, and you know, they, 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 guys, there's a competition going on, like sick as shit to do to a kid you know yeah. like, what are those guys Nambler 
you know, fucking running around. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, they got a website where they're competing. For a grown man you know. to be laying around with a bag of pecan sandies. I guess guy, that fucked up guy. on an idea. You know, he's eating the cookies. He's got his dick in his hand. There's a fucking picture of a four-year-old <laughs> up on the wall. You know, he's fucking it's thinking, fucked what up. can I do? <laughs> In the fucking landscape of abusing children, that has not been done. I need something fresh. I need a new idea. Oh my god! <laughs> I got it. Jeez. That's that what I'm saying. Great, yeah. We we did not have that last week. No, we did not. So that's that's very true. What's on uh, the horizon for you now? I'm just stunned at what I just said. You asked I know, me, I know. was there anything that come out of my mouth, and I can't believe it. My whole sperm cookie routine that I just did. Yeah, that's okay. You did the sperm cookie routine. <laughs> What's on the books now, Ali? <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm just back from uh, 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 spending a year on the East Coast in Connecticut shooting 100 episodes of Are We There Yet? Uh, and that'll be on the air in syndication in, uh, I think, June. And you've been directing those too, right? I uh, directed about 30 episodes of that. Because that's what you, that's, is, do you want to direct a movie or? Uh, no, I, I love TV. I, I love TV. TV is fantastic. I want to stay and keep working in TV. Uh, if somebody were to offer me a film, which is not going to occur, I would take it, sure. But, uh, you know, I do. I love television. It's been good to me. And, you know, I want to stay in that, you know, it's home. I yeah. get it. I like it. Um, but so now I got to come up with a new idea. You know, I'm a comic. You know, I did 100 episodes of that. Yeah, Yahoo for you. What else you got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need a new set. Um, when you were a little kid, and I'm, this is a dumb question, but when you were a little did kid. Did anybody feed you a sperm cookie? No. <laughs> They did not. Would you like one now, Joey? <laughs> uh, when you were a kid and you watched the Carol Burnett show, who yeah. was your favorite favorite character? Uh, I, I'm gonna. Do you know the Do you know the uh, actors on the Carol Burnett show? Tim Conway. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Harvey Corman. Corman. Vicky. Uh, 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 what was Vicky's last name? Lawrence. Vicky, Vicky Lawrence. The- <laughs> uh, Carol Burnett. Uh huh. And my favorite is the guy that you're forgetting to mention. All right. Lyle Wagner. Wow. Lyle Wagner. Wow. I fucking loved Lyle Wagner. Because. <laughs> Do you want to give him a sperm cookie on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lyle Wagner was the straight man. Yeah. He was the guy. It was, it, it's, you know, when you watch Tim Conway, you watch Harvey Corman, you know, these are the guys that are going out and it's a very aggressive form of funny. You know, they're doing big things, getting the jokes that way. I would watch Lyle Wagner. It's like his shit was like he'd lay back in the cut and it would come to him. And that was amazing to me. He was doing the least and getting as many laughs <laughs> as Harvey Corman and Tin Con. But it wasn't it wasn't appreciated in the same way. Right. You know, because he wasn't a big sort of outgoing. And I guess it speaks to, you know, w- what I do. It's like it's the guy that's, you know, he's. They can't do any of that shit without Lyle Wagner. He's counterpoint. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's five with four points, and then we got to fucking have one guy that's the center of this shit. You know, it's like the Seinfeld show. Jerry Seinfeld's the least funny guy on the show, but he's actually the funniest guy on the show. <laughs> Very but he's playing straight to the rest of these wacky guys. <laughs> You know, I fucking loved Lyle Wagner. That's that's me. Yeah, I'm, now that you say that, it's so funny. I I would have never in a million years guessed his name, <clears throat> but uh, you're absolutely right. Send that. this podcast to Lyle Wagner if he's still alive, which he probably is not. Uh, this podcast is a love letter to Lyle Wagner. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for taking time out of your day, and I just want to say happy birthday. It was your oh, uh, thank you, birthday. thank and, you, uh, I'm, well, thank you. For are we driving. telling everybody how old I am? Oh, dude, you look good. You look good, Ollie. Right. Fifty. Um, uh, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day and to drive all the way for, the for fuck you, in the valley. For you, uh, we, you know, when we did that gig at the uh, at the Hyatt, that was the night that Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. Oh, really? Yes. Wow, I remember we that gig together. for meeting you and your wife. Uh-huh. And then for, uh, and I told this story uh, to Joey before, is they had the elevator at the hotel and the Phoenix Suns were staying there. And <laughs> I remember I was waiting and the elevator opened and the whole, like, like five or six of them were in the elevator. It's five Suns. And, and I was, yeah, I was so stunned because they're fucking huge. And I was just like, whoa. And, and one of them goes, come on in, we won't hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I remember that gig. 
But again, thank you so much. And if you guys have any uh, comments you would like to make about uh, the Ali uh, uh, interview, you can give us an email at beautyandthebeastpodcast at gmail.com. We would certainly appreciate it. We would also appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a sweet little message for us because that helps drive our numbers in the what's hot list. By the way, we were uh, did good numbers this week. <clears throat> and we're quite uh, high up in, on the what hot, what's hot list. I don't mean to brag. Follow me on Twitter at, at MrLeroy.com. Yes, follow Ali on uh, Twitter. And uh, uh, we look forward to uh, uh, your 100th episode. Yes! Woo, That's I'm a great funny. thing. I, mean, I can't speak Twitter at MrLeroy.com. I'm fucking old. Dude, I'm on the Twitter. I'm on the uh, Twitter. <laughs> I do the tweeting. And, and we would also like to ask people, if you uh, by any chance are going to buy something off Amazon, if you go to our website and go through the little banner, uh, Amazon banner, it'll put you right on Amazon. You won't have to pay anything. It's just so they know that uh, our ad is working on our website. And we would certainly love for you to do that. Anything else? That's it. That's it. How are you doing over I'm there? I'm doing good. Yeah, Just relaxing. massaging that knee. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Stay black. <laughs>